Today we're going to combine everything we did in the previous videos to move the units on the grid during the combat. And by that I mean showing the reachables, moving the unit on the grid, consuming some movement points so if the unit consumes them all, it's going to have to wait to the next turn, and then we'll be able to move all the units on the grid during their turns. So let's get to it. So in Unreal, before starting the real subject of today's video, I'm gonna add myself two new uh, utilities function that we're gonna reuse today. So uh, first thing I'm gonna do is go in my grid and open a BP grid pathfinding. And what I'm going to do is go in neighbors and I have my function get value the tile neighbors right here. And if we go at the end of the function, just right here, we have a select node that tells us the cost of each of our tile, depending on the tile type. But this node right here, we're going to reuse it multiple places in the project. And we don't really want to copy paste that node everywhere. And every time we want to change the cost of one of our tile type, we're going to have to modify it everywhere. So instead of doing that, I'm just going to move it inside a function library that we already have. So I'm going to go in my entry and go in the uh, utility is uh, right here and open uh, bfl tile data i'm going to create myself a new function that i'm going to name uh, get tile type cost and what i'm going to do is go in my pathfinding copy the select node paste it right here and uh, reconstruct my function with the return at the end and here it is so i have my get tile type cost uh, taking the tile type as input and returning the cost at the end uh, just like that i'm also going to make it pure so it's easier to call and now i'm going to compile save uh, this function library and go back in the bp grid pathfinding to replace uh, the select node that we have right here so i'm just going to delete it and replace it with a new function so get tile type cost uh, and connect to the cost uh, like that here we go so now we have a nice function that tells us the tile type cost uh, wherever we are in the project uh, perfect so let's compile that and the second thing i want to do is a new utilities function inside the grid pathfinding so i'm just going to create myself a new function which i'm going to name get path cost so we're going to use this function to retrieve the cost of the whole path so we're simply going to add all the tiles together to give us the final cost of the whole path and here it is so i'm taking a path as input which is an array of endpoints so all the indexes of our paths and at the end i'm returning the cost which is an integer and to return it easily at the end i'm just going to create my Myself a new local variable that I have right here. So new local variable, I named it RET for return, and I'm just returning it at the end. At the beginning, I'm setting it to zero, so it starts at zero, and we're going to add all the cost of all of our tiles to it. And to do that, we're going to use a for each loop. So we're going to loop through all the path, uh, all the indexes that are in the path, and we're going to add all the cost of each tile to that return variable. So take the return variable, add the cost of the tile, and then set the return variable again, which is going to increment it. And then the last thing we need is the cost of our tile. So we just have to first get the tile from the grid tile. So we have the tile index, we're converting it to a tile data. And then from the tile data, we can access the tile type, which gives us the tile cost using the new function we just created. So here it is. We are now adding all the cost of all of our tiles in the path. And at the end, we're going to have the number, which tells us how long is that specific path. And that's it. We're done with the grid pathfinding and the BFL tile data for today. So we can close them both. And it's now time to go to the real subject of today's video so we're gonna have a new action that is going to let us move units on the grid this action is going to combine multiple other actions it's going to have the possibility to uh, show the reachable tiles also the possibility to move the units on the grid and the third uh, new action ish that we're gonna do is to when we are overing a unit with our cursor it's going to show its reachable also so uh, it's going to be a little bit more complex than just combining multiple actions together so that's why I'm just creating a new action instead of just uh, reusing what we already have. But most of the code is already coming from other actions. So you can copy paste it uh, from there. I'm just going to redo it from scratch because it's going to be faster in my case. But you can just go in the other actions and copy paste them if you want to. But uh, you can just follow me and it's going to be fine. Uh, so let's go create uh, that new action. So I'm going to go in my player actions here. And here we have the combat folder. If I open the combat folder, actually, it's mostly actions that are setting up the combat it's not really combat specific like during the combat we're more using them before the combat than during the combat so what i'm gonna do is just rename the folder to uh, have the combat folder specifically for the action that are used during the combat so i'm going to rename that one combat setup 
because we're going to use uh, this action really just to set up the combat. I'm just going to uh, fix up the redirector because it created some. Here we go. So now I have my new folder, combat setup, and I'm just going to recreate the combat folder. Combat. Because that's where we're going to put uh, the new action we're about to create. So let's create it. I'm going to right click on BP action and create a child blueprint class, which I'm going to name action underscore CBT underscore move. And then I'm going to move this action inside the combat folder. So move here. I'm just going to refix the direct redirector just to make sure it works. Okay, perfect. And now in the combat, I'm going to open the new blueprint and go in the event graph to do the logic of this action. But before jumping in the code, let's look at the design a little bit because it's a little bit more complicated than all the other actions. So now we are in combat. What do we want? Uh, we have a unit that is currently selected. It's our turn to play. What do we want to display to the player? Well, it would be nice to display the current unit reachable. So we want to display uh, where the current unit can move. So the player has an easier time to know where we can move the unit on the grid. So that's super simple. We just have to show the reachable. We already did that. That's great. But then we have the player input. So what do we want to do when the player move his mouse over one of the tiles that are in the current reachable? Well, it will be nice to display the path that a unit is going to follow if we click on that specific tile. So uh, if the player moves the mouse uh, around the unit, it's going to display the path. That's nice. That's fine. It's not too difficult. That should be fine. So uh, we display the reachable. We display the path uh, that will be used if the player clicks on the tile. So uh, if the player clicks on the tile, well, we are going to move the unit. So. That, that's just basic stuff. We just want to display visual cues that will help the player in his actions. So that's fine. That's not a big deal. Display the reachable, display the path, click, move the unit. That's fine. But then we have another thing right here. It will be nice that if the player moves his mouse over another unit, so an enemy unit or an ally unit, doesn't matter, it will be nice to display its reachable also. So it's going to help the player know where all the units on the grid can move because uh, sometimes there's a bunch of obstacles. There's the terrain, there's a different cost per tile and things like that. So uh, it will really be helpful if the player can have a visual of where the units can move on the grid and it's going to help him develop its strategy. So uh, that's why we are doing that. Uh, and then uh, after that, we have two other little things. Uh, it's just a quality of life. Uh, we want uh, when the unit is moving, we do not display the reachable. It's just going to look nicer if we don't display all the colors on all the tiles. So when the unit is moving and then when the unit finishes its movement, we want to hide the path. Uh, we want to keep the path displayed while the unit is moving. I think it's interesting, but if you think it's not, you can hide it before him. But uh, in my case, I just want to keep the path displayed until the unit is done moving. And once it's done moving, well, we can simply hide the path and that should be good. So that's about it. That's pretty much the design we're going to do today. So we have a bunch of little things that we want to do and it's going to take a bit of time. So let's get to it. So let's start by the beginning. So we want to display the current unit reachables uh, every time the unit is selected. So at the beginning of the turn, the unit starts the turn. We want to display the reachable of that specific unit. So most of the code that we're going to do right now, it's going to be a pretty much a copy paste of what we did in the select tile and unit and generate the reachable action. So if you want to copy from there, you can do it. Otherwise, uh, we can just follow along and you're going to uh, be just fine. So here it is. And back in my action combat move, I created myself two new functions. So I have the generate the reachable, which is the action that we're going to use to generate the reachable. And in this case, it's going to be a little bit different than the other function, the other action, I mean, because we want to uh, generate the reachable for multiple units because when the player moves his mouse over another unit we want to use that unit instead of the currently selected unit to display the reachables so that's why i have to uh, receive a unit as input right here to know which unit we want to use to generate the reachables obviously so that's why I have my generator reachable function using a unit as input. And then the way it works, it's going to ask the pathfinding to generate the reachable. And once it's done generating them, it's going to call a callback. And we have to attach ourselves to that callback to receive the reachable and then display them on screen. So that's why I have myself a new function here, a second function. So I have the on pathfinding completed underscore reachables. So this function is going to be called and it's going to receive all the reachables for the unit that we specified. So uh, this is where we are going to display the reachable on screen. But before we can do that, we have to connect ourselves to that callback. So I'm going to go back in the begin play to connect myself right here. So 
in the begin play, I'm just going to connect myself to the unpathfinding completed callback, which is inside the grid pathfinding reachable. It's really the reachable component that we want to use because it's for the reachables. And I'm connecting myself uh, with the new function we created. So the unpathfinding completed underscore reachable, the, the second function right here. So this is going to be called every time the function uh, is done generating the reachables. And finally, as we said in the design right here, we want to display the reachable as soon as the unit is selected. So the unit starts its turn and we want to display the reachable. So so that's why I'm just going to call the generator reachable right here at the beginning. So when we are creating the action, we are going to create it once the unit's turn starts. So the player is going to be able to now move the unit on the grid. So we want to uh, generate the reachable using the selected unit right away. So as soon as the action is created, we're going to generate the reachable uh, from the beginning. So uh, the player is going to know where he can move the unit. Uh, perfect. So now it's time to just do the logic of both function, which is going to be fast because we're going to copy paste everything from the other action or more or less. But the main difference between uh, this action and the previous one is this part right here, because we don't want to regenerate the reachable if they are already generated. Generated. So that's why I created myself a new variable right here to keep track of which unit is used to generate the reachable because in the case that let's say the player is uh, about to play, the current unit is selected, the current reachable are drawn on the grid, and then the player moves his mouse over the current unit. It's going to try to regenerate the reachables for that specific unit, which is already generated. So we don't want to waste time for that. So that's why I'm just adding a little check right here to make sure that we're not regenerating the reachable for no reason. So that's the main difference between this action and the previous action we did, but the rest is pretty much the same. So we clear uh, the reachable state uh, from the grid because we are about to generate uh, other reachables. So we don't need uh, the previous ones. And then uh, it's super simple. We just have to do a find path that is going to return us the reachable. So this is the exact same bit of code that we have in the other action. So that's why I'm just pasting it right here instead of the previous unit, though I'm using the current unit for reachable, uh, just the variable that we just created just to uh, make it a little bit more uniform. So we're starting from the current unit index and then we're looking for the reachable. So we can just feed it all the data it needs to define the reachables. And then we have to make sure to check the checkbox uh, return reachable to make sure that we are returning the reachable, obviously. And finally, just make sure that we're still using the grid pathfinding reachable right here because this is the one that we are attached to when the callback is going to be completed. So that's why we have to use that component. So good. And now the reachable are going to be generated. And once they're done generating, we are going to go inside the unpathfinding completed underscore reachable. And that's how we're going to display them on screen. So we are going to loop through all the reachable and add the state to the tiles. And that's it. So now the reachable should be visible at the beginning of the turn of every unit. So uh, to be able to test that, though, we still have to change something in the player action because we want to uh, select that action. That action is never used anywhere. So we have to select it. And we're going to do that in the BP player action. So I'm just going to go in the player action, open it right here. And then we're going to do in go in the function on unit to turn started to select the action. And to do that, we just have to call the set selected action function, just like that, after selecting the unit. And we're going to select the action we want to use, which is the CBT move. So action underscore CBT move, we're going to use that action. So the player now is going to be able to uh, move the unit in combat, or actually right now it's just going to display the reachable because we're not done with it. But uh, at least the action is going to work. Uh, so uh, we can select the action when the unit turn starts. Uh, and we're going to also deselect the action when the unit turns end. So I'm going to go in on unit to turn end then and paste the set selected action right here. And I'm going to select nothing. So no action for the left click or for the right click. Here we go. Now we can compile and save. And if we go back in the game, we should now see a result. So if I play and I'm going to add a few units on the grid, so let's say a warrior, a priest, and let's say a chicken. Why not? Uh, I have two chicken and let's say remove one. Here we go. So now when I press play, I have like the reachable for the selected unit. So right now my warrior can move and these are its reachable. And then if I go for the priest, we can see it's reachable right here on the grid. And then for the chicken, okay, that one can go pretty much everywhere on the grid. But yeah, so now it works. Uh, we can display the reachable of the selected unit. So that's great. Good. Uh, at least we know that the flu works. But now uh, every time we move the mouse over one of the other units, uh, we would like to be able to display those reachable instead of the current units reachable. So uh, we have to change a few things in the code to be able to do that. And that's what we're going to do. So let's stop and go back in the action and combat move. And actually to do that, it's super simple. We just have to override the function execute over the action, which is called every time the user passes his mouse over another tile. So this is called. And now what we're going to do is something like this. 
So every time the user moves this mouse over a new tile, we're just going to check, okay, do you have a unit that is currently overed because you overed a new tile? Maybe there was a unit on it. So uh, we're going to check if this one is valid. So if it is using, uh, if it has an overed unit that is valid, we're going to use that overed unit to generate the reachables. Otherwise, we're just going to uh, regenerate the reachable for the selected unit. So that way, if we pass our mouse over a new unit, it's going to generate the reachable for them. And then as soon as we go out of it, it's just going to re-regenerate the reachable for the selected unit. Okay, good. So now we should be able to save that and go test. Uh, and it should work, actually. So I'm just going to place two units on the grid, start the combat. So now it works. Uh, the reachable are still working if I go uh, one turn at a time. So that's good. And then if I move my mouse over the uh, other unit, we can see that it generates the reachable for it. Uh, so yeah, it seems to work. And the opposite uh, way around, it should work also. Yes, it works. So yeah, good. So that feature is done uh, and it seems to work properly. So good, the reachables are done. Now the next step is uh, to generate the path when we are moving the mouse over another tile, because right now it's not happening and we're not drawing anything. So we have to do that. And we're going to do that back in the combat move. And I'm going to create myself two new functions, one to generate the path and the other one to hook myself to the callback when the path is generated, the same way we did for the reachable. The first function is super simple. I named it a generate path and it doesn't have to uh, receive anything as input because we're only going to generate the path for the selected unit, not any other units. So that one is super simple. And the second one is called the unpathfinding completed underscore path. And that one has to receive the path as input because it's going to be called by the callback uh, when the path is generated. So uh, that's uh, why we have to feed it the path just like that. And now what we're going to do is go connect it to the callback. So I'm going to go in my even graph. I'm going to move my generate reachable on the side to have a little bit more room. And then I'm going to connect my callback in the middle just like that. So I have my callback on pathfinding completed right here on the grid pathfinding component, not the same one as for the reachable, really just the grid pathfinding component. And I'm connecting it to the unpathfinding completed underscore path function, which is the new function we just created on the left. So now every time the path is generated, it's going to call this function and we'll be able to display it on screen. But first we have to generate the path. So let's go in the generate path function to do it. And this function is pretty simple. We just have to do the exact same thing we did in the action find path to target before. So I'm just going to uh, go back in the action move to do it. But it's pretty much the same logic. So first we have to clear the is in path state from the grid because uh, we already drawn a path before. We are going to draw a new one. So let's delete the previous path. And that's what I'm doing right here. And then uh, we just have to do a find path using all the information of the selected unit. So on the grid pathfinding component, not the one for the reachable, really the one for the grid pathfinding. We are doing a find path uh, using the selected unit. So we are going to start from the index of the selected unit. And then we're going to uh, use the over tile as a target because the user uh, moved this mouse over a tile and we're going to use that tile as a target to where the unit might go if the user clicks on the tile. So uh, that's what I'm doing. And then we just feed it all the other information it needs to generate the path. And once the path is generated, it's going to call the callback, which is connected to the unpathfinding completed path that function just right here. And then we're just going to draw the path on the screen. And to do that, it's super simple. We just have to do a for each loop for all the indexes in the path and add them to the is in path state. Here we go. So now the path should be drawn on the screen. But actually, it's not really working right now because we're never calling the generate path function. So we're never generating a Path. So we're just going to go do that inside the execute over action because we want to generate the path every time the user uh, moves this mouse over a tile that is part of the reachables. So what we're going to do is do a generate path after uh, calling this the generate reachables right here on the selected unit. Uh, that way, every time the user moves this mouse over a tile that doesn't have a unit on it, it's going to generate the reachable, which is fine. And then it's going to generate the path. And then the pathfinding is going to decide if it is a valid path or not. And it should work. So I'm just going to compile and go see in game how it looks. So I'm going to add a few units here and there. So I'm going to add a chicken because it's more fun. And here now, OK, good. If I move my mouse over one tile that is part of the reachable, it now draws the path. Uh, properly. So that's good. It draws nothing if I'm outside of the range. And if I'm on the chicken, we can see that it shows the range of the chicken. And if I do a end turn to go uh, have the chicken as my main unit, now I should be able to draw a path for the chicken. Great. Okay. So that seems to work fine. Good. Uh, okay. And now if I go back on the other one, yeah, we can see that it works fine. Good. Okay. Now the next step will be that if I click on the grid, it should move the unit because right now it doesn't. So let's go do that. Then we can stop, go back in the action move.
So to do that, we need to take the pad that was already generated uh, when we were hovering on the tiles that were in the reachable of the unit, take that pad and feed it to the unit and ask it to move. We could actually just regenerate the pad when the user clicks on the grid, but I think it would make way more sense to just save the variable and then feed it to the unit directly without really calculating it every time. So what I'm going to do is go inside the unpath finding completed path, uh, this one right here, which uh, we received the path, and I'm just going to save it inside a variable to keep it and feed it to the unit later on, maybe uh, if we need to. So I'm just going to promote it to a variable, which I'm going to name a generated path, uh, just like that. And then I'm just going to reconnect my for each loop just like so and now we have the variable that we can then feed to the unit but this variable right now uh, we're only setting it every time we are generating a path we should also clear it every time we are trying to generate a new path that way the unit is never going to have uh, a path uh, feed to it that is completely invalid so that's why uh, we have to go back inside the generated path function right here the generate path i mean and then we have to clear it also so we're just going to clear it before uh, calculating a new path so just reconnect everything just like that right here. And now, yeah, uh, we are clearing the path uh, drawn on the grid. We are clearing the variable. So now the variable doesn't have anything in it. And then we are asking the code to generate a new path. Once the code is done generating the path, it's going to reset the variable to the new valid path, which is good. And then we just have to feed that path to the unit. And to do that, well, we just have to override uh, the execute action function because that's the uh, function that is called every time the user clicks on the grid. So we're just going to override the execute action function, reconnect the index just like that in the parent. And then we can do everything else uh, that we need to do to feed uh, the generate path to the unit. And actually, it's not that difficult. We have to first check to make sure that the generated path is valid. So if there's something in the generated path variable, we're going to feed it to the uh, to the unit. Otherwise, we're not going to because we don't want to feed it a path that is empty. It will not make sense. And then we just have to call the event follow path uh, passing it the generated path. So we're going to tell the unit, OK, you can move now using that path. And then uh, finally, once we're done feeding the path to the unit, we're just going to clear the variable because we don't want to reuse it multiple times. We just want to feed it once. And that's why we're doing that. So we are clicking on the grid. We are feeding the path to the unit. And then we're just clearing the variable. Uh, so it is not reused uh, multiple times. Perfect. So now we can test and see how it looks in the game. So I'm just going to add two units right here and right there. And now I can draw the path on the grid. And if I click it, the unit now moves uh, great. And I can move it again and again and again if I want to. Uh, there's a problem with their reachables, though. They are not regenerated and they are still back at the beginning. So that's weird. And actually, uh, while the unit is moving, we want to hide them. So uh, we have to change a few things for that. We want to hide the reachables uh, when the unit starts moving. And then we want to regenerate them as soon as the unit stops moving from the new tile. So. Uh, we are going to move the reachable around uh, following the unit. Uh, and also, uh, it would be nice to be able to keep the pad displayed uh, while the unit is moving. Uh, even if I'm trying to move my mouse uh, all over the place, it should not hide the path and try to recalculate another path. It should wait until the unit is done moving. So that's a few things we're going to change. So let's go back in the combat uh, action uh, just to do that. And to know when the unit starts and stops moving, we need to attach ourselves to the callback uh, that are inside the unit. So I'm going to create myself two new functions, uh, one for the on unit started walking, uh, receiving a unit as input, because that's how the callback works. And the second one is on unit finished walking, uh, receiving also a unit as input, because that's how it works. And then we're going to go attach ourselves to those callback inside the, the begin play in the graph. So right here, I'm going to connect my new callbacks in the middle, just like that. And here they are. So I have my on unit started walking callback, which is connected to the on unit started walking function, which is created, and also the on unit finished uh, walking callback, which is connected to the on unit finished walking uh, function we just created also. So yeah, we have those uh, two functions that are now called every time the unit starts and stops moving. So we now just have to do the logic to uh, regenerate the reachables, hide them, and uh, display the path and things like that. And here, the first thing we want to do is to hide the reachable while the unit is walking. So when the unit starts walking, we just have to clear the reachable. It's as simple as that. We clear the state from tile is reachable. And then we also have to say that the uh, current unit for reachable is now invalid because uh, we are not using any units for the reachable because we don't display any reachables right now. So that's why we just have to cancel that variable also. That way they are uh, linked together properly and they are not broken. And then the other thing that we want to do is to regenerate the reachable once the unit is done walking. So 
uh, on the unit finished walking, we just have to call the on uh, the execute over action uh, function. Uh, inside that function, we are regenerating the reachable, depending if we are uh, overing another unit or the current unit otherwise. So that's why if we call the uh, execute over the action inside the finished walking, it's going to regenerate the reachable for the current unit. But we still have a few things to do if we want the functionality to work properly, because right now there's nothing stopping the player to regenerate another path or maybe the reachable for another unit while the unit is walking. It's only stopping it from uh, generating the current reachable. So it's going to hide the current reachables but if the player tries to regenerate the new reachables they are still going to show on the screen and we don't want that we just want the current path to be highlighted nothing else so that's why and what i'm going to do is just create myself a new variable to uh, keep track of when the unit is walking so new variable is going to be a boolean and i named it is unit walking and what i'm going to do is just set it to true while the unit is walking and to false when the unit stops walking so in the on unit finished walking since i'm here i'm just going to set it to false directly right here so the unit stopped walking uh, the unit is not walking anymore makes sense and then i'm going to go in my on unit start Started walking just to make it to true so when the unit starts working we now know that it is good okay so that's done now we have to use the those boolean and we have to use them at two places in the code the first place is when the user moves his mouse over another unit or another tile on the path uh, on the grid i mean because we don't want the player to regenerate something else while the unit is moving so we're going to go inside the execute over the action just right here and we're not going to do any of that code while the unit is walking so i'm just going to add myself a little branch right here and just execute execute the rest of the code if the unit is not working. So if the branch is false, that way the player is not going to be able to regenerate uh, anything uh, while the unit is walking. And the other place we need to uh, place that variable in that branch actually is inside the unpathfinding completed underscore reachables because it's possible that the player asked for reachables before drawing the path and asking the unit to move. And if the reachable took a little bit too much time, so maybe one second uh, because there was too many calculations to do for that pathfinding, this function is going to be called after the unit started walking and it's going to generate the reachable again. And that's not what we want. We want to make sure that we are only generating and showing the reachables when the unit is not walking. So that's why even if this function is called later on after the unit walked and started walking, we're just going to stop the flow and say, okay, not draw anything, do not draw anything. The unit is walking right now. So do not draw anything right here. So that's it. Uh, now the functionality should work properly. So I'm going to go in game and see how it looks. I'm going to add a few chickens on the grid because they are the one with most uh, movement points. And here it is. Now I have my range. And if I, I like the other chicken, we can set it works. And if I click on the grid, so let's say right here to start moving the chickens, even if I over anything else, it doesn't regenerate the reachables and it only keeps the path visible while the unit is walking. Great. So now it looks pretty good. I'm happy with that. Uh, yeah. So uh, that's done with this. Uh, we still have a few things to change though, but uh, but it's not really visible in game. So let's go see how it looks in the code. And I'm going to tell you what we have to change. So back in the uh, start uh, execute action right here, when we are asking the unit to move on the path, we are directly fading the path to the unit. But I think it will make way more sense to go through the combat system so that way the combat system can do some validation to make sure that the unit can really move there and you are not just trying to cheat the game or things like that. So uh, instead of feeding the path directly to the unit, I'm going to add a wrapper around that function inside the combat system that we're going to call, which is going to end up calling the follow path function uh, later on. But uh, that should help uh, the flow of the game and just make sure that everything works as ex expected. So I'm going to go in my combat and open the VP combat system to create uh, my new function for that. I simply name the function move unit and I'm passing it to input. So the unit that we want to move and then the path that we want the unit to follow. So two inputs, unit and path. And for the logic right now, we're going to keep it super simple. We simply call uh, the uh, event follow path on the unit itself. So we're simply passing in the path to the unit and tell it to move. We're going to add multiple validations in the future. Maybe, maybe not. But for now, we're simply going to ask the unit to move and that should be good enough. So that's good. We can compile this and go use it in the action combat move. So I'm going to go back here. I'm going to move the event out of the way and replace it by the event inside the combat system, just like that. I'm just going to connect it instead. Here we go. So now uh, in the combat system, I'm calling the move unit function, passing it the selected unit and the generated path. Here we go. Now we can delete this and that's it. And there's just one last thing I want to do today in this action. And it is actually a bit of cleanup because it's possible that uh, when the action gets deleted from the game, 
there are still some states that are visible on the grid. So maybe the unit was still uh, moving. Uh, so there's a pad drawn or maybe some reachables. So what we're going to do is just uh, override right here in the functions, uh, the end play function, which is going to create the event in the event graph. I'm going to add a call to the parent function just so uh, it can be run if it needs to be. And then what I'm going to do is just clear my states uh, that are on my grid. So I'm just going to do that. So when uh, the actor gets destroyed, we're going to clear the reachables and also the path. That way, uh, everything's going to be clean and ready for uh, the next action or the next unit to play. Perfect. Now we can compile and save uh, the action combat move. We're not going to need it today and we can close it. Great. And actually, before going to the next step, there's actually another place in the project that was moving uh, the units on the grid, and it was using the function that is directly inside the unit instead of going through the combat system. So I think it will make more sense to go through the combat system for that one too. So uh, this is inside the player actions in Pathfinding. So we have the action move unit on grid. So let's go in there. And in there, inside the uh, on uh, pathfinding completed function right here, that's where I am. Uh, at the end of the function, we were asking the unit to follow the path uh, that was generated. So instead of going through uh, directly to the unit, we're just going to go through the command system. I think it makes way more sense uh, to have the same thing everywhere in the project. So that's why I'm just going to replace the code by this. We're going to call the move unit in the command system, passing in the current unit and the path the same way we did before. Here we go. So that should not break anything. You, know, you, shall, you can go test it if you want to, but I'm pretty confident that it should still work as expected. Perfect. Now we can save and close this action too. So that's what we have right now. We are able to move the units on the grid and it works well. We are able to move it and it works pretty damn fine. That's good, but there's just one issue. I don't know if you see it right now, but I'm able to move the unit uh, all over the place during one turn. I'm not skipping my turn right now. So the unit can move over and over and over until the end of time, and that's not good. What we need to do is to limit the amount of movement point, and so we have to decrease the amount of movement point of the unit every time it moves on the grid, and right now we don't have that feature yet. So that's why we have to do it. Uh, so what I'm going to do is stop and add a way to track the current and maximum movement point of the unit. So I'm going to go in my units in the utilities and open the S unit data stats right here. We have the MP current, which are the current movement point, but we don't have a maximum, the same one we have for the HP. So uh, it would be nice to create the maximum. So I'm going to create myself a new variable, the MP max. It's going to be an integer and the default value is going to be maybe three. Doesn't really matter. We're going to change it in the data table anyway. And what I'm going to do is just move uh, this uh, MP current down just so it's near the MP max in my structure. It doesn't really matter either. Perfect. Now we can uh, save uh, this structure and go in the data table to assign all the movement point maximum for all of our units. So I'm just going to do that real quick. And here we go. So for my wire, I've set it to three maximum movement point, Ranger 5, Priest 4, Slime 3, Chicken 10, and the Bat 3 movement point maximum. Perfect. Now I'm just going to save the data table, close it, and now we're going to go create a few functions in the BP unit to modify the current movement point. So I'm going to go in my BP units right here and create myself, let's say, three new functions. So one, two, three functions. And actually, for these three functions, it's going to go pretty fast because it's pretty much what we did for the modify current HP and set current HP, but for the movement point instead of the L point, that's it. That's going to be pretty similar. So uh, we're going to start with the first function, which is uh, named the set current MP. So which we're going to use that function to set the current MP of our unit. So I'm taking my MP as input, so an integer that says how many uh, movement points we want to set to the unit. And then uh, I'm also passing a boolean to tell uh, if we want to discrete the animated number or not. That way, if we remove movement point from the unit or add movement point to the unit, it's going to appear above its head and it's going to be nicer, I think. So that's why I have uh, the boolean right here. So uh, for the logic of the function, it's going to be pretty similar as the previous one, but there's one exception at the beginning of the function. I'm just going to save uh, the difference of the movement point uh, between uh, the current movement point and the new amount of movement point. Uh, I'm saving that inside a local variable. We're going to reuse that variable when we want to spawn the animated number at the end of the function. So that's why we have to keep track of the difference so we know uh, which number we want to write above the head of the unit. And then we're back with the original logic of the function. So we have to set the movement point of the unit. So to do that, we just have to get the unit data, break it to access the stats that are inside it, and then do a set members to set the current uh, movement point. And to feed it the movement point, well, we just have to pass it the current movement point that we received as input. So we received the uh, movement point we want to set. 
I'm just clamping it to make sure that it never exceeds the maximum amount of movement points. But in your case, if you want to be able to exceed that amount, you don't have to uh, put the clamp right here. It's not necessary if you don't want to. And then uh, once we're done setting the variable inside the first structure, we have to set it back inside the unit data. That's just how it works. We have to set the data in the first structure and then set it back in the parent structure. So that's it. Now we're modifying the unit's uh, movement point. But uh, we also want to display the number on the screen. So that's why right here I'm adding myself a little branch to see if we want to display the number on the screen. So if the shown number is equal to true and if the difference is not equal to zero, we're going to spawn a number. If the difference is zero, well, we're not going to spawn a zero above the unit. It will not make sense. So that's why I'm just checking to make sure that it is not equal to zero. And if it is not, and if we want to show the number, well, I'm just going to spawn the animated number the same way we did for the HP point. So perfect. I'm passing it the difference as the number we want to write. And that should be good. We should now uh, decrease the amount of movement point of our units or increase it if you want to. And then we are going to spawn the animated number. Then the second function is the modify current MP function, and that one is super simple. We just have to uh, pass it the modifier we want to apply on top of the current movement point, and also we want to say if we want to display the animated numbers or not. So it's going to be exactly the same thing as we did for the modify current HP. So we're simply going to call the set the current MP passing in the modifier plus the current movement point. So we have three movement points, we are adding plus one or minus one, and then we feed that to the set current MP, passing it also the show animated number. That way, we're going to know if we want to spawn the number or not. And for the last function, it's the simplest one. So I called it a reset MP, and we're going to do that multiple times in the project because we want to reset the movement point of the unit, let's say at the beginning of the turn or not, maybe, maybe not, maybe at the end of the turn, at the beginning of the combat, at the end of the combat, or any times we want to reset the movement point of the unit, we're going to do that action multiple times in the project. So that's why I'm creating a function for it. It's super simple, but I think it makes more sense to have its own function and it's super simple. We just have to set the current movement point by passing it the MP max. So we're just going to set the current amount of movement points back to their maximum. And that's it. So good, we can compile and save this. And we're actually going to go use this function a few places in this blueprint. So here in the combat flow, I have the combat started function, which is called at the beginning of the combat. So why not resetting the movement point at the beginning of the combat? So the unit is going to be full movement point at the beginning. So that's good. Then I have the turn started. This one, I'm not going to reset the movement point at the beginning of the turn because let's say another unit modified the current unit movements point. I don't want to reset at the beginning of the turn. I want it to last until the end of the turn. So that's why I'm not going to reset at the beginning of the turn, but at the end. So here in turn, and then I'm going to reset the amount of movement point. Here we go. And the last place I want to reset the movement point is at the end of the combat, because why not? The combat is over, so let's reset everything. Perfect. Now we can compile, save the BP unit. And the last thing we need to do is to uh, subtract the movement point from the unit when it is moving. And we're going to do that inside the combat system. So in the move unit function, we're going to subtract a few movement points. And to do that, it's actually super simple. We have to first uh, retrieve the cost of the path. So doing a get path cost, uh, which is the function we created at the beginning of the video. So this function returns us the cost of the path. Uh, what we're going to do is put it in negative. So I'm going to minus the cost of the path. That way we're going to subtract movement point from the unit and not add movement point to the unit every time the unit moves. That will be weird. And then we just have to subtract the movement point from the unit uh, by calling the modify current movement point. And that's it. Now we should be able to go in the game and see that the unit uh, have some movement points subtracted from it every time it moves. So I'm going to add a few chickens on the grid and start the combat. Now I can start with 10 movement points, so that's great. And if I move my unit, it writes minus 8. And now my movement range is super small. It's two movement points. So I can move one, move one again, and that's it. Now I can end my turn and my movement points are reset, so that's good. And if I move the other unit, now I can move by 5, 4, and then if I end my turn, the movement points are reset. So that's good. That feature works. Uh, there's a few issues, though. The first one is that the numbers are red. I don't like using red for the movement point. I think it's more HP. Uh, it's more for the HP. So I'm going to use this another color, so maybe a green for the movement point. And also the other thing that I would like is that right now, every time I move, it writes the maximum uh, the total cost of the pad, so it writes like let's say minus 10, minus 3. 
Uh, but I think it would be better if it was writing it every tile. So if I move on one tile that was costing two, one or zero movement point, I would like to write that amount on top of the head of the unit, not at the beginning of the path. That way, instead of writing, let's say, minus nine right now, it will write minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one every tile. Uh, it can be a bit spammy. I don't know if that's a good idea, but I think that's how I'm going to do it for now. But anyway, uh, let's go do those two things. And I'm going to start with the color of the text. So let's go do that. And to select which color we want to use, I think it would be better to use an enum instead of just writing the color code every time we are spawning an animated number in the game. So I'm just going to use an enum to do it. So I'm going to go in my widget, create myself a new enum, so blueprint enumeration, which I'm going to name E underscore animated number color. And inside that enum, I'm going to add myself two colors. So I have the red for the HP point and the green for the movement point. So red and green. And now we can save the enum, close it and go apply it in the widget animated number. So I have the widget animated number right here and by default it's red but we're going to go change that in the graph. So right here. And here the first thing I'm going to do is select my event and add myself a new parameter as input. So here I have my color which is of type E animated number color which is the enum we just created. And now I'm just going to give myself a little bit more room right here because I want to set the color of my text. So I'm taking my text animated number and do a set color and opacity to set the color and opacity of the text. I'm going to split the structure right here to have access to the color. And then I'm going to select the color using the select node. The color is going to be based on the index that we receive as input. So the color right there. And if we select red, well, I'm going to display red. And if we select green, well, I'm going to display green instead. Here we go. So now that should change the color of the text, but we have to change one last thing in the blueprint for it to work. So I'm going to go back in entry here and open and a BP underscore animated number. And here is the place where we are feeding the number and the color to the widget. So we have to also feed it the color. So I'm just going to promote it to a new variable. I'm going to name it color and I'm going to make it instance editable and exposed on spawn. That way it's going to be simple to set it. Now let's compile this, save this and go back in the unit to apply the right color to the text when we are moving the unit on the grid. So in the function set the current MP right there, I'm going to go at the end. This is where we are spawning the animated number. I'm just going to refresh the node to have access to the color parameter meter we just created and change the color from red to green. Here we go. Now we can compile save. And if we go back in the game, the number should now be green. So I'm just going to put some units on the grid. Here we go. And now if I move them, so uh, start combat, move the unit, minus seven written in green. So that's good. That's exactly what I want. Perfect. So now uh, the color is done and we just now just have to uh, make sure to spawn the text every time the unit moves one tile instead of just spawning it at the beginning of the path. So let's go do that. And we're going to do that super quickly in the combat system. So right here, when we are moving the unit on the grid, we say that we want to show the number. But in this case, we don't want to. So I'm just going to uncheck that checkbox. So we're not going to show the number at the beginning of the path when we are asking the unit to move. But instead, we're going to show it every time the unit reach a new tile. So I'm going to go inside the on unit reach new tile function right here. And I'm going to simply spawn myself as a, an animated number on the grid. So I'm taking the actor location of my unit spawning the animated number on the grid and I'm passing it uh, the cost of uh, that specific tile that, that the unit just arrived on. So the unit reached a tile and we are just taking its cost and spawning the number above the unit's head. Make sure that the color is green because it's for the movement points. Perfect. Now we can compile save and just that it should make that the uh, numbers appear above the head of the unit every time they reach a new tile. So I'm just going to start the game just like that. And now I'm going to move my unit on the grid. Minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. So yeah, we can see that it, it spawns every tile. So that's good. And I think it works pretty well. And the fun thing about that is just that it's going to uh, look nicer when we are moving above tiles that are not uh, minus one. So let's say these tiles minus two, minus two, minus two. So now uh, we know how much uh, it cost to walk uh, on top of those tiles specifically, not only the full cost of the whole pack. So I think it looks nicer like that, but you don't have to do it if you uh, prefer just to show the, the final number at the beginning of the path like it was before. And now, just before ending the video, I just want to fix one last little thing. And it's a bug that has been there since like forever, since we did the pathfinding at the beginning. Uh, I wanted to fix that for a while, but I didn't uh, take the time to do it. So we're going to do that today. And actually, the problem is that uh, every time we are moving a unit on the grid, the current index of the unit is updated every time the unit reaches a new tile, which makes sense. It, it, it totally makes sense. 
but uh, it could cause a problem in the case that uh, multiple units are moving at the same time and one and, and they are crossing their path so if the unit moves on a tile that was already used by another unit at the same time it will break the whole game completely and i don't really like that i would like to uh, make sure that the uh, final tile of the path so this tile right here practic here this will be the final index of the unit and that should be the updated index of the unit as soon as i click on the tile uh, that way uh, everything is always going to be up to date as soon as the action is triggered because we can't cancel the action in the in the middle of it so it doesn't matter uh, that the unit is updating its path at the beginning or at the end so i think it will make sense to update the index as soon as we click on the tile and that's what we're gonna do in the combat system and actually the bit of code that is responsible to set the, the unit index is this one right here so every time the unit reaches a new tile right now we are updating the unit index but we're not gonna do that anymore we're gonna delete uh, this function and reconnect the flow just like that uh, and instead we're going to go uh, where we are asking the unit to move and set the index directly so we're going to do that inside the move unit function and we're going to do it at the end right here so i'm just going to call my set unit index on grid right here at the end and for the index i'm going to use the last index of my path so the, directly from the beginning we know which one is the last index of the path so we can just feed it to the function and it's going to set uh, the index on the unit directly but there's just one little problem in there though if i open this function right here we can see that uh, after setting the index of the unit uh, we are snapping its position right here we are setting the actor location of the unit on top of the grid depending on its index but we don't want to do that in this case because the unit is moving and the unit is going to move on the grid following the path until the last tile so that we don't want to snap it to the last tile directly we want the unit to move directly slowly until reaching the last tile so uh, instead of doing that what i'm going to do is just adding myself a little a branch right here so if uh, a branch right here to add myself a new condition as input to uh, decide if we want to snap the location or not so i'm going to name it the snap location and then we'll be able to decide if we want to snap the location or not of the unit uh, when we are setting the uh, unit index just make sure to set uh, the default value of the snap location to be true because everywhere else in the code right now is assuming that we are going to snap the location of the unit so we don't want to break anything in the game so that's why uh, we are going to set the default value to true so everything else in the game right now is using uh, this default value which is going to be true so that's good it's going to always snap to the location uh, by default which is exactly what we want but in our case if we go back in uh, the function move unit we want to uncheck that checkbox right here so uncheck the snap location for the move unit that way the unit not, is not going to snap at that location it's just going to move uh, following the path as usual meaning that now the data is always up to date as soon as we execute the action the index is set properly and the unit is just acting as visual it's moving slowly towards the uh, real index perfect so now we should be able uh, to test all that and i'm gonna see how it goes okay so everything in the combat tab was working as expected but i found a little bug right here when we are adding a unit on top of the grid inside the pathfinding tab and then we are trying to move it using the move uh, the select move unit action i'm just going to move the unit like that we can set it works that's not a problem but when i move the unit too much now i'm left with only one movement point and now i don't have any movement point anymore so i cannot move the unit anymore because the unit cannot move so what we're going to do is just resetting the movement point inside that action every time the unit stops moving that way we can continue debugging the unit movement if we need to so i'm going to go in my action so actions uh, at finding and open a move unit on grid right here and then right after asking the unit to move right here in the on pathfinding completed function at the end we're going to ask the unit to move and then we're just going to reset its movement point that way we're still going to be able to move the unit over and over and over until the end of time so simply take the current unit and reset its movement point and that should fix the problem but actually i found another problem before ending the video and it is in the combat system it's going to be super quick in the combat system in the function move unit i realized that here if we are trying to fetch the last index of an array that is empty it's going to break the game because uh, there's no index in an array that is empty so what i'm going to do is just that if we are trying to call this function here the move unit function with an empty array as path what i'm just going to do is i'm just going to block the flow because there's nothing to uh, use as a path the unit cannot follow anything anyway because the path is empty so i'm just going to uh, make sure here with a branch that 
the path is at least of a length of one, so at least one element in the array, and that way we can make sure that the unit is going to follow the path properly and it's not going to break the game with anything else. Perfect, so uh, I guess that's gonna be it for today, let's see. And here we go, so now I have my chicken on my grid and I can move it, it's resetting its movement point, move again, resetting the movement point again and again and again, and I'm now able to move all my units on my grid as I want, perfect. And also if you're bored, you can just hold your right mouse button and it looks a little bit like this, woo, with the chicken going all over the place, <laughs> that's awesome. Anyway, I guess that's gonna be it for today's video and I'm gonna see you in the next one, bye bye.